Greetings and welcome back. We are in Sing Your English B, and we are continuing our work with Samuel Taylor Coleridge's The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And we are now looking at, on page 837 of your hymnals, part 6, and then of course part 7 to finish our study reading of Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Let's go ahead now and go back to the professional reading. You should be reading now closely, and then uh, we'll finish uh, this poem, and then we'll come back with some final comments. But tell me, tell me, speak again, thy soft response renewing. What makes that ship drive on so fast? What is the ocean doing? Second voice. Still as a slave before his lord, the ocean hath no blast. His great bright eye most silently up to the moon is cast. If he may know which way to go, for she guides him smooth or grim, See, brother, see how graciously she looketh down on him. The mariner hath been cast into a trance, for the angelic power causeth the vessel to drive northward faster than human life could endure. First voice. But why drives on that ship so fast, without all wave or wind? Second voice. The air is cut away before and closes from behind. Fly, brother, fly, more high, more high, or we shall be belated. For slow and slow that ship will go when the mariner's trance is abated. The supernatural motion is retarded. The mariner awakes, and his penance begins anew. I woke, and we were sailing on as in a gentle weather. T'was night, calm night, the moon was high. The dead men stood together. All stood together on the deck for a charnel dungeon litter. All fixed on me their stony eyes that in the moon did glitter. The pang, the curse with which they died had never passed away. I could not draw my eyes from theirs nor turn them up to pray. The curse is finally expiated. And now this spell was snapped. Once more I viewed the ocean green, and looked far forth, yet little saw of what had else been seen. Like one that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round, walks on, and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. But soon there breathed a wind on me, nor sound nor motion made. Its path was not upon the sea, in ripple or in shade. It raised my hair, it fanned my cheek like a meadow gale of spring. It mingled strangely with my fears, yet it felt like a welcoming. Swiftly, swiftly flew the ship, Yet she sailed softly too, sweetly, sweetly blew the breeze, on me alone it blew. And the ancient mariner beholdeth his native country. Oh, dream of joy, is this indeed the lighthouse top I see? Is this the hill? Is this the kirk? Is this mine own country? We drifted on the harbor bay. And I with sobs did pray, Oh, let me be awake, my God, Or let me sleep alway. The harbor bay was clear as glass, So smoothly it was strewn. And on the bay the moonlight lay, And the shadow of the moon. The rock shone bright, The kirk no less, That stands above the rock, The moonlight steeped in silentness, The steady weathercock. The angelic spirits leave the dead bodies. And the bay was white with silent light, till rising from the same, full many shapes that shadows were in crimson colors came, and appear in their own forms of light. A little distance from the prow those crimson shadows were. I turned my eyes upon the deck Oh, Christ, what saw I there? 
Each course lay flat, lifeless and flat. And by the holy road, a man, oh light, a seraph man, on every course there stood. This seraph band, each waved his hand. It was a heavenly sight. They stood as signals to the land, each one a lovely light. This seraph band, each waved his hand. No voice did they impart. No voice, but oh, the silence sank like music on my heart. But soon I heard the dash of oars. I heard the pilot's cheer. My head was turned for force away. And I saw a boat appear. The pilot and the pilot's boy. I heard them coming fast. Dear Lord in heaven, it was a joy the dead men could not blast. I saw a third. I heard his voice. It is the hermit, good. He singeth loud his godly hymns that he makes in the wood. He'll shrieve my soul. He'll wash away the albatross's blood. Part seven. Final part. The hermit of the wood. This hermit good lives in that wood which slopes down to the sea. How loudly his sweet voice he rears. He loves to talk with mariners that come from a far country. He kneels at morn and noon and eve. He hath a cushion plump. It is the moss that wholly hides the rotted old oak stump. The skiff boat neared. I heard them talk. Why, this is strange, I trow. Why are those lights so many and fair, that signal made but now? Approacheth the ship with wonder. Strange by my faith, the hermit said, and they answered not our cheer. The planks looked warped, and see those sails, how thin they are, and sere. I never saw aught like to them, unless the chance it were. Brown skeletons of leaves that lag my forest brook along. When the ivy tod is heavy with snow, and the owlet whoops to the wolf below that eats the she-wolf's young. Dear Lord, it hath a fiendish look. The pilot made reply. I am afeard, push on, push on, said the hermit cheerily. The boat came closer to the ship, but I nor spake nor stirred. The boat came close beneath the ship, and straight a sound was heard. The ship suddenly sinketh. Under the water it rumbled on, still louder and more dread. It reached the ship, it split the bay. The ship went down like lead. The ancient mariner is saved in the pilot's boat. Stunned by that loud and dreadful sound, which sky and ocean smote, like one that hath been seven days drowned, my body lay afloat. But swift as dreams, myself I found within the pilot's boat. <coughs> Upon the well where sank the ship, the boat spun round and round. And all was still, save that the hill was telling of the sound. I moved my lips, the pilot shrieked, and fell down in a fit. The holy hermit raised his eyes and prayed where he did sit. I took the oars. The pilot's boy, who now doth crazy go, laughed loud and long, and all the while his eyes went to and fro. Ha-ha, quoth he, full plain I see, the devil knows how to row. And now, all in my own country, I stood on the firm land. The hermit stepped forth from the boat, and scarcely he could stand. The ancient man earnestly entreateth the hermit to shrieve him, and the penance of life falls on him. Oh, shrieve me! Shrieve me, holy man. The 
moment crossed his brow. Say quick, quoth he, I bid thee say, what manner of man art thou? Forthwith this frame of mine was wrenched with a woeful agony, which forced me to begin my tale, and then it left me free. And ever and anon, throughout his future life, an agony constraineth him to travel from land to land. Since then, at an uncertain hour, that agony returns. Until my ghastly tale is told, this heart within me burns. I pass like night from land to land. I have strange power of speech. That moment that his face I see, I know the man that must hear me. To him my tale I teach. What loud uproar bursts from their door? The wedding guests are there. But in the garden bower, the bride and bridesmaids singing are. And hark the little vesper bell, which biddeth me to prayer. O oh, wedding guest, this soul hath been alone on a wide, wide sea. Famous wife. So lonely it was, that God himself scarce seemed there to be. Oh, sweeter than the marriage feast, tis sweeter far to me to walk together to the kirk with a goodly company. To walk together to the kirk and all together pray while each to his great father bends. Old men and babes and loving friends and youths and maidens gay. And to teach by his own example, love and reverence to all things that God made and loveth. Farewell, farewell, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest. He prayeth well, who loveth well, both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best, who loveth best, all things both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, he made and loveth all. The mariner, whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar, is gone. And now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. He went like one that hath been stunned and is of sense forlorn. A sadder and a wiser man, he rose the morrow morn. Now the poem is going to end on 845, notice this. The poem is going to end with a series of observations. You're supposed to learn something from the reading of this poem, okay? We're going to be told, in fact, what that is. So that's the first question you want to jot down in your notes. What are we supposed to learn from this poem? It's right there in the poem. What is it that we are supposed to learn? Okay, so what's the lesson? Ah, we might say it this way. What is the moral to the story? What's the point? What are we supposed to learn? Question number two. At the very end of the poem, when the old man is done, the young man hears the music again of the party that he's been missing. Warp Tour, to go back to my original example, is behind. And the music is starting to again ramp up. The party is about to happen. Let's go have some fun. Let's go, let's go, let's go. That's how he was before, remember? The very last stanza of this poem, though, tells us that the kid, not the old man, the kid, read it with me, the last stanza, he went away like one that hath been stunned. We know what that means, right? To be stunned. And is of sense forlorn. The, we're told the kid turned from the bridegroom's door. He doesn't go to the party. Last two lines. A sadder and a wiser man he rose the morrow morn. Two observations here. One, for your notes. One, the kid 
walks away from the party. Dude, he was so excited to go to the party, remember? In fact, he was so excited that when the old man started telling the story, he started thumping or beating on his chest like, dude, would you just hurry it up? For those of you that have ever been in a hurry and then you were driving somewhere and you got behind a really old person that's going like 35,000 miles below the speed limit, and you're like, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. That's what the kid is like at the beginning of the poem. But by the end of the poem, the old man finishes his story, and the kid goes, I don't want to go to a party. I ain't interested in a party no more. And he, and he walks away. He goes away. He doesn't go to the party. And then we're told the next morning, when he finally wakes up, two things about him. He's wiser, but he's also sadder. He wakes up the next morning. Which begs a really intriguing question. Let's put it in our notes. We'll come back to it. We'll answer this question in our next session. It's this question. What is it about this story that would lead to three things? One, the kid decides to not go to the party. Two, the kid wakes up the next morning a lot wiser. Three, the kid wakes up the next morning a lot sadder. What about this story and the telling of this story would lead this young kid to those three responses? Like, why didn't he just, you know, when the old man finishes the story, why didn't he go, yeah, 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 nice story, I gotta go to the party. Instead, he is stunned, we're told, by the story this old man tells, this whacked out story about being out on the middle of the ocean and everybody dies after he kills his bird and all of them come back to life and then finally he gets back home and he's kind of saved at the very end. It's kind of a weird story. The question now that's central to understanding or appreciating this poem is, why does the young man first elect to not go to the park when he was so excited to go? Well, he just goes home. And then why by the next morning does he wake up a whole lot wiser but a whole lot sadder? Finally, I'll ask this 3A relational question. And boy, oh boy, if you can get this one tomorrow, I may even think about plus points on a test sheet. It's this question. What does the poem Ten Turn Abbey say specifically about the question I've just asked? Is there any relationship? See how I'm asking you to find some contiguity between these two texts now. Is there any relationship between what Wordsworth says about growing older and losing your youth and what we learn at the end of this poem about this young kid who hears a story and then the story has fundamentally changed him? Finally, we can finish with a 3B question. It's an interesting one. Have you ever been exposed to a movie or to a song or to a video of a song or to a concert maybe or something like that. Some experience that you had where after you had it, it somehow changed you fundamentally. It kind of changed the way you thought about the world and the, and the way you saw the world. Can you jot down a moment in your own biography when that ever happened for you? What was that story? What was that song? What was that movie? Maybe for some of you it was a movie. You walked out of the movie you were like, Oh, that totally blew my mind and makes me think totally different. It made you wiser, but in some ways it also made you sadder. Or did you have an experience maybe in your life that left you kind of like that? For some of us, maybe it was the attending of a funeral of a person who we cared for. And after the funeral, we were somehow different. It affected us in somehow a different way. That's this question of 3B. In other words, trying to understand why would this kid... Walk away from the party. Dude, he was so excited to go to the party. He was going to have such a great, great time. What is it in this story that would lead that kid to that kind of a response? We'll come back in our next session and discuss that 